Okay, so um, a bit of a different lineup as you'll see this morning. Our usual co host Caroline is away celebrating a big birthday. So I'm standing in for her. So for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Sam Grant and I um, am head of business development at the IAB. I've been on most of the coffee mornings. I hope you'll have seen me. Um, so Sarah is also away. She is in London at a HMRC event and Kerry is, um, is stepping in for her today. So she'll give you more detail on what Sarah's up to while she's out and about today. Um, I guess the biggest event since uh, the last coffee morning is the awards. Um, general feeling and feedback, I think, was that everyone had a great time. So congratulations to all the winners, if there's any winners on the call. Um, it was a it was a great day. Um, there are also there are lots of photos. If any of you haven't seen them, there's lots of photos and video on the website. It was shared on social as well. But if you wanted to relive the event in any way or or have a have a have a nosy, um, everything's on the uh, website under the event section. Um, and also, if you haven't received your copy of IAB Connect, uh, this, this quarterly edition, there's a feature um, on the awards in that which will detail pictures of all the winners. Um, and it will also, um, there's a really good article about the um, about the judging. So we'll hear from the judge's perspective of, of their judging experience. So that's definitely um, worth a read. So uh, without further ado, um, our speakers today have been selected based on suggested topics from our ambassador groups. Um, and they're here to give independent, uh, impartial advice. So first up is Jenny Davis. So Jenny is a partner at Calder and Co Chartered Accountants, and she's acted as an accountant and tax advisor to the IAB for the past three years. Uh, today, Jenny is going to be helping you to unravel the intricacies of directors' loan accounts. <laughs> and by the end of the session, you'll be able to understand how loans are formed, the tax implications of having them, and some of the ways that they can be repaid. So um, over to you, Jenny. Thanks very much. Sam, would you just like to give me the access to be able to share my screen and I can it get will. the slides up for you? Um, I think Good. if you try to already do it. Yeah, and it's disabled at the moment. Oh, right, okay. First thing. First admin techie bits as well. <laughs> I'll say I'm a Teams girl, so any help would be a oh, we go. At the bottom, yeah. In the participants menu, if you make me if you right click on me and make me a co-host, right, okay, or you, you might need to just it. enable screen sharing. That's what I was doing as enable. Yeah, it, it just says there we go. Got enable. It. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, got it. Yeah, we're there. There I we go. There. I didn't go down the participants route. <laughs> no problem at all. Right. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. Give me a little thumbs up if you can, please. Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, so um, as Sam has already said, my name is Jenny Davis. Um, I am a, uh, well, what am I? I am a chartered accountant. Um, and in my role as the chartered accountant, um, I sort of progressed up through an accountancy firm um, until about seven years ago when I became a partner um, at Calder & Co. And Calder is a small firm based in central London. Um, but as you can see from the slide there, um, during the time that it's taken me to train, I've uh, undertaken quite a lot of different trainings. So I am a fellow of both the ICAW and the ACCA. Um, and I'm also a uh, CTA qualified uh, tax advisor as well. Today, what are we going to be talking about? So we are going to be talking about what I like to call the tax tango uh, of the director's loan accounts. And hopefully by the end of the session, you're going to understand a little bit more about how they work, uh, how they're created, how they can be cleared, um, and also the various tax implications that they bring. So as I mentioned, director's loans, what are they? How are they created? We're going to talk about Section 455 tax, which is a temporary tax um, that is a part of the corporation tax return for companies where uh, these might be in place. Uh, we're also going to talk about taxable benefits, so how they impact on P11Ds specifically, um, and then the repayment options. So we'll start with the director's loans themselves. So. Director's loans are most commonly seen in the accounts of smaller businesses, so smaller owner-managed businesses. And they tend to arise as a result of directors who 
take money from the business over the course of the year when they maybe aren't quite sure about how much profit they're going to have come the end of the year. And maybe they don't want to take a big salary because maybe they're working to the kind of the old school method of low salary, high dividend profit extraction. Now, as part of that, what they tend to do instead is to build up a loan account over the course of the year, which at the end of the year gets repaid somehow. And we'll look at the different repayment methods later on. So when they're in credit, a director's loan account is great for the director because it essentially means that they've pretty much got an account sitting there with the business from which they can withdraw money as and when the business has got the funds and they're not gonna impact on the working capital too much. Um, and they can freely withdraw that with no tax implications whatsoever, because essentially when the loan account is in credit, it means that the director has put money into the business and it is able to freely take that money back out as you would with any loan that you'd made to somebody. The difficulty comes when the accounts are in debit. So when they're in debit, they raise a number of questions around the potential taxation and the legality of having those loans in place. But one of the really key things for you to understand is that there's a bit of a de minimis with director's loans and £10,000 is an absolute key figure. So if you're going to make any notes, uh, jot down the number 10000 because it's really super key for director's loans. Now, if a director is going to take loans from their company, then um, that loan is very likely to need shareholder approval. So the very first thing that you should be talking to clients about when you see a director's loan on their books is, do they have an approval in place for that loan to be there? Now, the, uh, the approval is normally done by way of a resolution. So it's essentially a shareholder's resolution, which says um, that the company is permitted to make loans of up to X amount um, to a director um, as and when required. And they will normally attach a rate of interest or potentially a fixed repayment date. But most people, because they're in, talking about owner managed businesses, they like to keep this pit, pit quite flexible. And therefore, they will just say that the loan is repayable on demand um, and maybe link the interest rate to HMRC. Now, once you've got that approval in place and a loan can be made, the director may build up this loan account. If they do so, we then have to look at the tax consequences of that. Now, Section 455 tax is a temporary tax that is charged and it goes through the company's corporation tax returns. It is specifically interested in the outstanding loan balance at the company's accounting reference date, so the company's year end. Now, depending on how much is outstanding at that date, and the date by which that money is going to be repaid, there may be a tax charge. The tax charge is normally at 33.75% uh, of the outstanding loan balance. If a loan just gets a bit bigger each year, rather than being repaid and a new loan taken out, then um, you pay the tax on the increase in the loan account each year. Now, prior to April uh, of last year, um, that tax was at 32.5%. And some of you may recognise those, those rates. They are essentially designed to be in line with some of the personal tax rates on dividends. Now, the reason for this is that it was seen by HMRC that directors were taking these loans rather than declaring a dividend from the company. It was a way for them to extract the funds, which seemingly had no tax consequences. And so section 455 tax was introduced in order to prevent that and to mean that the tax consequences hit at the point of the loan being taken. In theory, what then happens is that when the loan is repaid, that tax can be reclaimed because at that point, the assumption by HMRC is that somehow that loan is going to have been either physically repaid or converted to an income stream for the director. The most likely income stream is going to be dividends and therefore it is going to have been taxed at the dividend tax rates within their personal tax. So the company gets the tax back. 
Now you'll notice that I'm talking there specifically about dividends and you might think to yourself, well, a, a director doesn't necessarily get dividends. How's this gonna work? Section 455 only applies where you are dealing with a close company. And a close company by definition is generally a company which has five or fewer shareholders. And in most cases, we're talking here specifically about owner managed businesses where the shareholder and directors are one and the same people. Um, in which case, as a shareholder, they're entitled to dividends. And so the director's loan accounts are often repaid using that dividend route. Now, if a loan is outstanding at the company's year end, but it is repaid within nine months and one day of the year end date, then actually the relief for the team uh, having to pay that section 455 tax is given immediately. So the company doesn't physically have to pay the tax. It has to declare that the loan was made, but it, that it was repaid within that payment date. If the loan is outstanding for longer, then the tax has to physically be paid and it can be reclaimed nine months and one day after the end of the accounting period in which the loan was repaid. Now, Section 455 tax um, generally targets any size of loan that is outstanding. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, specifically where the loan is to somebody who is a shareholder and a director and specifically within closed companies. Now, the second type of tax that is seriously impacted uh, by a director's loan account, which is in debit, is taxable benefits. So this is where your P11Ds come in. And this is targeting the employee side of the arrangement. So as we know, directors are technically employees of a business. And as such, if they receive a taxable benefit of some form, they have to declare those benefits on a P11D. So I've taken an extract here from the most recent P11Ds. This is section H, which specifically deals with loans. And this is where you would be declaring any uh, debit balances on a director's loan account. Now, this only applies, and this is where the key figure of 10,000 pounds comes in again. It only applies if the amount outstanding at any point during the year, during the tax year was more than 10,000 pounds. So if a director has a loan, which they've kept below that 10,000 mark uh, throughout the year, then there's no issue um, in terms of the amount that has to be uh, declared on a P11D. If, however, it goes over 10,000 uh, pounds for any number of days during that year, then a P11D is required. Now, there are two ways to, uh, or there's one other way in which you can get around the submission of a P11D. And that is through charging interest. So on HMRC's website, they disclose what they call the beneficial loan rates of interest. And a director's loan is considered a beneficial loan. So if the director pays interest on the outstanding loan at the beneficial loan rate, then there is actually no taxable benefit. Okay. Now, there are two ways in which the interest can be calculated. You can either use the stripped method, which means having a running balance of the balance on the loan account throughout the year and calculating the interest day by day using the attached interest rate. The alternative is to look at the balance at the start of the year and to the, or at the point that the loan account became overdrawn and to look at the balance immediately before the loan was repaid or at the end of the year if it hasn't been repaid. You then calculate the average of those two balances and you apply the interest rate for the whole year to that average. HMRC allow you to decide which of those two rates you use, which means you can use the most beneficial rate, or the most beneficial method for the customers. So that might mean that somebody has a, uh, a loan of £1,000 at the start of the year and it creeps up and creeps up and creeps up. And then by the time we get to um, maybe the middle of the year, it goes up above that 10000 mark, but maybe it only goes up to 10001 And at the end of the year, maybe it's crept up some more, but then it's come back down again. And so at the end of the year, it's still at the 10001 so you'd be charging, if you use the average rate, you'd be charging the interest on the 10,001 uh, for the whole year. 
if you were to use the strict method in that instance, particularly if it had crept up quite significantly during the year before it came back down again, it may be that the interest charge would be a lot higher. So you can choose which method of interest calculation is going to be best for you. Once you declare it, there is the obvious situation whereby the uh, director will need to put this P11D onto their personal tax return and pay tax on the, uh, on the benefit. And there is also the class 1A national insurance, which the company will have to pay. So there's an immediate tax consequence to the company of the class 1A, and then a tax consequence to the director on their personal tax return. How do we go about repaying the loans? As you can see on the screen, there are a number of different methods. The most simple and straightforward is that a director just repays directly out of their own funds. Uh, if they do that, um, there is no tax consequence as such of doing so in that there's no tax charge on them personally because they haven't taken any kind of income in order to repay the loan. However, obviously that's not great for their cash flow. And it may have been specifically why they were taking the loan account in the first place. They may have needed the cash. The second option is a dividend declaration. So where it is a shareholder that's taken the loan as well as a director, um, there could be a dividend declared by the company. And rather than that dividend being declared and paid, it is deemed to have been paid when it is credited to the director's loan account. So that can act as a repayment, and it is probably the most common method of repaying loans. Separately from that, um, there may be other income streams that you take, and this might be something like maybe the director takes a salary but just has an annual payroll scheme. And so the annual payroll scheme goes in against that loan account and reduces it. It could be that the director is maybe charging the company a rent for using their home as an office, and maybe the rent is offset to that loan account. In each of those cases, there are personal tax implications for the director at the time, but those can be handled through the director's personal tax return. The final method is that the loan can be written off. And if the loan is written off, um, immediately you have an income stream for the director's and a beneficial, uh, a benefit in kind, which needs to be declared. So again, we're gonna have an impact on a P11D if we do that. Now, pretty much any of the methods are going to result in uh, repayment of any section 455 that has been paid by the company, but by a tax liability then arising on the director themselves. Somehow, sometimes though, this is worth doing just from a timing perspective because the company may have the funds to be able to pay the section 455, whereas the director may not have the funds to be able to pay the money, uh, the personal tax on a dividend at that point in time. Whereas if you pay the section 455 and reclaim it later, eventually the director may be in a position where they can take the dividend and pay the tax over without, uh, without it causing too much of a financial hardship issue. So in summary, uh, be on the lookout for loans. When you're working on a client's records, uh, look out for where a director has maybe taken a bit more than you think they should have, maybe more than their salary would suggest, um, and just make them aware that they may actually need to have agreements in place in order to facilitate these loans actually existing in the first place, and make them aware of the tax consequences of the level of those loans. It is very, very possible for a loan to trigger either section 455 tax or a benefit in kind, or in some cases, both. Um, so you need to be aware of the different factors that build into each one of those. So for P11D and the benefit in kind, it's gotta be more than 10,000 pounds at some point during the year. But if it's less than 10,000 pounds, but outstanding at the year end, then that would trigger the section 455. So be aware of the differences and the different interactions in those taxes and how they might impact on your clients. Finally, be aware that there is anti-avoidance in place. So there is something called the bed and breakfast in rules, which essentially means that a director cannot take a loan, immediately repay it before the year end, and then take another one the day after the year end. Um, the bed and breakfast in rules catch people that try and do this. Um, and essentially, if that loan is retaken within about a 30-day period, uh, HMRC will look at it as one continuous loan. 
So just be aware that there is anti-avoidance and if any directors try to be a little bit smart and say, we're gonna do this, just warn them that that won't work. Um, and I think as a quick summary of director's loan accounts, that's pretty much where we come to. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Jenny. It's very concise. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? There isn't anything in the chat at the moment. Um, if anybody has any questions they want to put in the chat, then please do so and I can ask, Jen, ask Jenny. Other than that, it's been some really good feedback, uh, Jenny, saying great presentation. Thank you. Um, been really helpful. Very, very informative. So, um, oh, we have one here. Um, Atana Mateo. Um, you mentioned loan salary and Divis is old fashioned. Yeah, so the re I, I refer to it as old fashioned, it's only old by about six months. Um, so the reason I say old fashioned route is because um, prior to the uh, changes to the corporation tax rates that happened in April, uh, it was very much standard thinking and it was pretty much the same for everybody that it was going to be better for a director shareholder to take a low salary, high dividend option in order to make the most of the tax benefits of having a company. However, following the changes to the corporation tax rates that happened in April and the new increased uh, corp tax rate, um, that logic doesn't always hold firm anymore. So it is now very much more about individual one-on-one -on -one tax planning for clients looking at their specific situation. So what is the profit level of their um, corporate entity? What other personal income do they have? And actually for them now, in some cases, it may be better for them to take a higher salary and get the reduction in the corporation tax rate to pay the lower rates of corp tax um, than it would have been previously. So uh, everything's changed as of April. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from Michael Parnell. Is the interest charged a tax liability for the company? Uh, it, is an, it is an income stream for the company. So yes, that income stream would then be subject to corporation tax. He also said it was a great presentation, so thank you. <laughs> um, David Humble has a question. Uh, what is um, effect of borrowing via director's loan to buy uh, buy to let property? Um, well, first of all, you'd have to be borrowing quite a chunk uh, to be able to do that. Um, and therefore, I would immediately say that you are probably going to have uh, a benefit in kind and probably section 455 because I'd assume that that loan is going to be outstanding for a reasonably long period of time. Perhaps they're taking the money out as the deposit, they're going to refurb and then plan to extend the mortgage and pay it back. Um, I've seen that done. Um, it is possible to do it. Um, however, they do have to be aware of the temporary tax uh, from the section 455 and the potential benefit in kind unless they're going to pay the company the interest. Um, so it works in exactly the same way. It can be done in the same way, but you do just have to be aware that there's going to be these tax consequences for the company of doing it. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, where you have used the interest method, what is the double entry posting? Um, so it is a straightforward uh, credit to the PL for interest received um, and a debit to the director's loan account. So the interest increases uh, the balance from the director's loan account. In most cases, the director may choose to pay the interest, in which case it would be a debit to the bank. Um, but in most cases, what they do is just add it to the loan balance. OK, great. We've got three more questions. And then what I'll do, if there's any more that come after that, I'll, I'll take a note of them, Jenny, and we'll... Um... We'll get back to those people later. So I'll go through the final three. Um, could you please clarify the calculation of beneficial loan interest using the average method? If the outstanding loan above 10,000 is only for a few months during the year and the remaining months are below 10,000, does the interest is, does the interest only calculate for four months? Yes, so for the number of months that the uh, balance was above the 10,000 pound mark, um, I mean, ideally, what we what we do 
it, personally within our, our practice is that if the balance is overdrawn, we charge the interest um, because sometimes it could be below, uh, it could be like 9,000 and something, but the interest might tip it over. So we will always charge the interest if they're anywhere near close. Um, but essentially, yes, you could do it just purely for the four months that the balance is overdrawn um, and add that. Excellent. There's, there's one here, and you have to excuse my ignorance if I have to, um, if I pronounce it, it's from, it's from Marion. So Marion, if, I pronounce, if I'm not getting it right, I apologise. Um, I don't know if it's, is there a minimum for directors overdrawn accounts or is it a technical, is there a de minimis for directors overdrawn accounts? No, they can be they can be overdrawn by anything from as little as a pound all the way up to hundreds of thousands of pounds. I've seen directors loan accounts that have been overdrawn into the millions. Um, where that happens, um, quite often there is an exit strategy from the loan, which even quite often involves the person moving abroad and declaring a final dividend or closing the company and taking capital treatment um, in order to actually reduce the personal tax liability. That gets into a whole world of other tax planning if you go that route. Um, but essentially, the loan account itself can be overdrawn by anything from a pound. Um, the, the minimus of 10,000 only really applies where you're looking at either needing shareholder approval um, or um, the P11D benefits. Excellent. Thank you. And, and final one now, Jenny. Um, how do you get the um, Section 455 tax back? Is it via an amended amendment to the CT600? No, that's actually a very good question. It's actually surprisingly difficult to get back. Um, so if the company <laughs> has had to pay the Section 455 physically, then what happens is... Um, Following repayment of the loan, what normally happens is you prepare the next CT600. When you send it in, you also attach another form, which is called an L2P. Uh, that form asks you to specify the loan amount, when the loan was made, which accounting period it was made in, um, and uh, the dates of repayment. And that L2P form is the one which then triggers the repayment. So we normally submit it with a CT600, but we put a little cross in the box that says that a repayment is due for an earlier period, just so that HMRC actually go looking to find out why. Otherwise, they tend to ignore the L2P that you've attached. Um, and then uh, once they find the L2P, they will process it. Quite often it requires a, a call to chase them up because quite often they uh, they sit on that and don't repay it. But they will only repay on the tax due date for uh, the accounting period in which it was repaid. So you can't repay it and get the tax immediately. Um, it can be kind of 18, 19 months before you get the repayment uh, of the tax because you have to wait for the end of the accounting period, submit the CT600 and get to the tax due date before HMRC will repay it. Thank you very much. Right. So uh, that was that was great, Jenny. Lots of questions there. Um, Jenny's presentation will be linked to the coffee morning recording. Um, if anybody wants to follow up and obviously I'll put a reminder um, on the next newsletter as to, to what Jenny spoke about. But thank you very much. Um, the next person, our second speaker is Eloise. Um, Eloise Hammond. Eloise is a Charter Financial Planner at Skirit and has previously done some work with Sarah because she works very closely with business owners and their accountants and bookkeepers. Um, and today she is talking about retirement planning. So by the end of this session, you will have a, a very good understanding of the value in retirement planning um, and the touch points where accounting and financial planning can interact. So I'll pass over to you, Eloise. You should be able to share having... Thank you, Sarah participants right can you all see my screen okay yeah okay perfect um so yeah good morning everyone thank you for having me as um, sam's kind of said my name is eloise hammond and i'm a chartered financial planner at skerritts so today i'm going to speak to you about retirement planning so we spend our whole lives working, saving, dreaming of retirement, but very few people actually stop to plan it. Um, we actually saw a stat that people spend more time each year planning their summer holidays than they do their retirement, which is a little bit worrying. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about financial health checks, cash flow planning, profit extraction, because I think business owners appreciate the need to have a business plan to keep our cash flows and so on. But the reality is that they need to be doing the same thing with their personal finances, as both personal and business plans need to align when it comes to retirement. So when it comes to financial health check, it's really vital to first, first of all establish where you are today. So, you know, what is your current position? What are your objectives? You know, are you on track? Are there any planning gaps which we need to fill? 
So we'd always start by asking, you know, what is your budget? So it's looking at income and expenditure, both personally and also from a business perspective. I appreciate the costs have gone up, obviously, because of inflation. So, you know, where are you currently? What emergency fund do you have? Again, it's saying, you know, you need to have at least three to six months worth of outgoings in cash as a buffer. If anything were to go wrong, again, personally, if, you know, the car breaks, the boiler breaks, or from, you know, a company point of view, what happens you need to buy new machinery, or you've got, you know, something coming up that you weren't expecting. Any short-term expenditure also needs to be kept in cash. So this is for the next one to three years. So again, if you've got any plans, whether it's personally an extension or, you know, a new car um, or actually from a corporate side, again, what happens if you're doing some big marketing campaign or some, you know, big kind of launch? Again, you want to make sure you have adequate funds putting cash aside to cover that. And then we want you to review your existing policies. So, you know, what policies do you have? It's really scary, but a lot of business owners we speak to, they've got loads of historic pension pots and things scattered all around, and they actually lose track of them because these pension providers might sell to other companies or get passed on to other companies. Um, so what we'll find is actually people lose track of it. So it's a case of saying, you know, who are your policies with? Why are they with those companies? How are they being managed? Do they offer the flexibility that you might actually want when you come to accessing those pots? Because again, a lot of pensions changed and they, the older schemes were less flexible. So since Flexi Access Drawdown came into play, again, it's making sure, does your scheme allow you to do what you might want it to? So once we kind of recognize what you've got at the moment, the question is, where do you want to be? So what age do you want to retire and how? So again, People used to have this cliff edge retirement, so we thought so you'd basically work, you'd retire, you'd sell your business, and that would be it. But what we're seeing is actually a lot of business owners might phase into retirement. They might go part time, they might, you know, sell their business and, you know, say they'll stay on for a couple of years or something like this. Also, when they sell their business, you know, are you going to physically get a lump sum? Will you get a regular income stream from the company for the next few years? What is the exit plan? And with those funds, will they qualify for business relief? Again, what is the kind of the tax position on the money which you're receiving? Because let's say you qualify for business relief. We want to make sure, make sure we maintain that business relief for you. Because if suddenly you qualify for business relief, and then you move that money into your current account the next day in your personal bank, that's now liable to inheritance tax. So again, we've got to try to work with you to make sure that actually whatever you've got is being handled accurately. So then the next question is, well, how much income do you want in retirement? And actually, based on that, how much savings do you need to achieve this? A lot of business owners, this is the kind of big question. They say, if I want X, what do I need Y? You know, so again, it's trying to work out how much money do you actually need and then be able to work back with saying, are you on track? And then it's saying to somebody, okay, well, what happens if you don't achieve this? So let's say, heaven forbid, markets go against you. You know, We have another COVID scenario. If something happens and actually the world isn't quite where we thought it was, then what? So then it's a question of saying, okay, well, would you go part time? Would you keep working longer? Would you have a lower level of income? It's trying to kind of look at these different scenarios just so people can establish where are you now? Where do you want to be? And what if? What happens? What do we do? So cash flow planning is always the next stage of the conversation when talking about retirement planning, because, again, as I said, business owners are used to having forecasts and planning and so on when it comes to the businesses. And we need to do the same for them when it comes to their financial planning. So what we personally do is we will basically use software. So we've got cash flow planning software and there's lots of different types. Well, this is one called Voyant. Um, we're basically you can plug in everything that you've got. So income, expenditure, any planned big spends and things like that. So this is actually a, a cash flow we did for a new client. So along the bottom, you'll see all of the ages. It's him and his wife who are looking at. So you've got their age, they're 45, running up to age 100. They want to retire at 65. Now, the bars kind of going upwards, those are basically the income streams coming in. So at the moment, this couple has got a salary, which is that kind of mid blue color and some rental income, which is purple coming in. And we've inflation proof that again, we do different scenarios and different assumptions, but we've inflation proof this for them. Now, the black line is showing you what they actually need. So what is their expenditure? So that takes into account your day to day expenditure, tax, things like this. So if, if you had to pay for mortgage, if there are any requirements that would factor that in. So that's why it kind of wibbles along the way, because then there are slightly different expenditure requirements for these clients along the way. Now, what you'll see is from age 65, they've now retired. So the salaries that mid blue stops yeah. coming in. At that point, they are obviously now living off continued rental income to the purple. The dark green was the final salary pension that the gentleman had. And then the orange and pale blue, those are just different savings pots with, which they've got. Now, what you will notice is actually towards the end of the plan, there's a little bit of red that comes in. So that dark red around 84, 85 starts to kick in. Now, that basically means based on the client's current plan and the current expenditure requirements, they would actually run out of their liquid savings 
by that point. So they'd have to fall back and simply be drawing rental income, state pension, and also this defined benefit pension, which they've got. So they'd either have to say, okay, either I'm going to have to reduce my expenditure and my lifestyle, or I might have to look at selling the property or something like this. So we sat down with the client and said, okay, well, what can we do and how can we better this? So what is really important, I think, when people are looking at retirement planning, the accumulation stage, so the where you put it when you're saving is just as important as when you look at the decumulation. So how are you going to pull it out? Because you'll have these earnings, you'll work out what you can afford to save. Just make sure that you're using all your allowances. So ISA allowance, your pension allowance, capital gains tax allowances. You want to use all of these allowances during the saving period because actually then you're getting more tax efficient growth. In the same sense, when it comes to decumulating, we want to make sure you've got different pots of money because then you can use your personal allowance, your savings allowance, dividend allowance, all the different allowances. So you're basically paying far less tax when it comes out. So this is why I think people historically you should just put into pensions or just put into, let's say, rental property portfolios or so on. But the thing to recognise is when you come to retire, then your state pension, your pension um your personal pension income, you know, let's say you've got rental properties, all those three types of income streams are liable to income tax and will realistically use up your personal allowance. So you're all in one kind of tax bracket, as it were. Trying to spread across different tax wrappers means you can receive more income out and pay less tax. So what you'll see here is we did a slight jiggling around. We changed to where he was saving and kind of looked deeper at income and expenditure requirements and so on. And the bottom half of the graph shows you what we basically changed and the different outcome. So we changed the order in which he was putting money out and we basically changed where he was saving it. And what you'll see is actually the red now only kicks in very slightly at age 99. So just making a few tweaks, we're able to obviously do this for him. And the nice thing is, again, we can do lots of different scenarios. So with this, we can show what happens if there's a market crash, what happens if there's inheritance. We can do different scenarios and help them really tangibly see if I do X, what happens? If I do Y, what happens? So it's really trying to kind of sense check your planning and help get the big financial decisions right. So profit extraction is something we're talking to a lot of business owners about um, because I think it's quite topical. Um, now, the average business owner is age 48 and the Office of National Statistics actually says this is the age when individuals income will peak. So this is the age whereby you'll probably get the most income coming in um, during your kind of working lifetime. They've also said that actually at this point in your life, you'll see your expenditure slowly start to decline. And the reason being is you might have already, let's say, bought the house and put the deposit down. You've potentially already got married and things like that. So the kind of the big spends you have in your younger years, you've, you've pretty much got out of the way. So as a result of that, you can sit there saying, OK, well, this is the stage where you really start looking at retirement. Thinking, okay, if I've got excess income, if I'm earning more, what can I be doing to look forward to retirement? And this is when we tend to get involved with a lot of clients is when they're kind of in their early 40s. So I think that's when retirement comes a bit more of a, a topic that people want to look at. So pensions have always been an attractive place to save because of the tax efficiency. So whether you are a sole trader or an individual making pension contributions, as you will be aware, you have to get tax relief from the contributions going in. So every £100 you want to pay in, you'd only put 18 and the government would give you 20. Now, as an employer or a business owner, the employer contributions are really attractive because in essence, the company can make a pension contribution directly into your pension for you. It's an allowable expense to your saving on corporation tax and NI. And obviously with corporation tax potentially going up for quite a few people recently, it's a nice thing to be able to offset and to save some money for that. Um, you also have to get tax efficient growth, so your pensions will grow tax free. And then when you come to actually take benefits, the first 25% is tax free. And thereafter, you'll draw an income of some sort, depending upon what you want. And that will be liable to income tax at your marginal rate. Now, the death benefits pension is also very attractive to a lot of business owners, because, again, business owners normally have quite large estates, should we say. So, again, when it comes to looking at how to pass money down the generations, we're actually seeing a lot of business owners almost shifting, whereby they're extracting profit into pensions, but then leaving the pensions as a legacy, saying, actually, I'm never going to touch that pension. I'm going to save into it and actually know I can pass that down the generations to my children, grandchildren, even to the next door neighbour, if you want, and know that I can get past inheritance tax free. And the great thing as well is under flex tax, it's draw down this far more flexibility for those beneficiaries as to how they then take the income or what they then do with it. So pensions is naturally very attractive. Now, pensions have a uh, like to change and the rules around pensions change quite frequently, as we've seen this year alone. So we always say it's really important to take advice and to also keep up to date with what's going on. Um, and the thing is, with that, also then your financial planning, therefore, needs to be flexible because you might plan something today. But if the legislation changes, you have to be able to adapt. So 
the big one was obviously the lifetime allowance was abolished. So we've seen this year that actually the lifetime allowance previously just saved a million has now been abolished. So many business owners previously suspended contributions into pensions because if they were nearly at that lifetime allowance level, they were thinking, well, I don't want to pay into this only to be then taxed, the lifetime allowance tax charge off the back of it. So a lot of people did see saving into their pensions. So a lot of conversations we're having with people now are saying, okay, well, should we be starting to pay in now? Because actually the fact that this is gone, whether it's temporarily or not, depending upon what happens with labour coming in, all these kind of rumours you hear out there, but what should we be doing? Now, for those that never had any lifetime allowance protection, because I don't know if you're aware, but you could have historically taken out protection. So when the lifetime allowance would be 1.8, then dropped to 1.5, 1.25 and so on, you could take out protection. So some people have already got protection in place. So I saw a client yesterday that's got a one and a half million pound protection law in place for his lifetime allowance. And he was saying to me, what do we do? Do we pay in more? Because actually that's almost irrelevant now because there is no lifetime allowance or do I keep it? So if you have no protection in place, a lot of people are wanting to still pay in. And, you know, you can quite happily do that because you're not really losing anything. The risk is, is if you do have protection in place, you're potentially impacting your tax free cash entitlement. Because although the lifetime allowance is gone, they are still capping how much tax free cash you can have out of a pension. So for my client yesterday who had the one and a half million pound protection, you know, we've said to him, actually, you want to keep that protection because you can take 25 percent of that one and a half million. If you lose that protection, you're now limited only to 25 percent of just over a million. So it's just kind of looking at what you do and what is right, which is why we always say take advice because it's not quite as clear cut as people think it is. We've also seen the annual allowance increase to £60,000. This was previously 40, so this is how much you can pay into a pension each tax year. Um, again, a lot of people are happy by this. You can be paying more in, extracting more out of the company, generally being tax efficient, especially with obviously corporation tax going up. Um, and the money purchase annual allowance also increased to 10000 So this is saying if I've already taken benefits, if I've taken income from a pension, you are then limited as to how much you can pay into a pension moving forward. So this is now £10,000. Now, Pensions give added flexibility because with other allowances such as your ISA capital gains, you know, it is very much a use it or lose it each tax year. Whereas with pensions, there's something called carry forward, which exists, which in essence means if you haven't used all of your allowances, you can carry forward the last three years into this year. Now, there are lots of caveats. You have to be a member of the pension scheme, have the relevant earnings, use this year's allowance first and so on. So we would always say take advice again, because it's not quite as simple as I'm probably making out. But the key thing is you can review that. So when we're sitting down with a lot of our business owner clients that let's say during COVID cease paying the pensions, reduce their payments in um, because they were conscious about profits. You know, they weren't sure what was happening with their businesses. And they said, okay, I need to kind of hold back. We're going to reduce the pension contributions. But well, potentially now you can actually kind of carry forward the unused allowances and make sure that you aren't actually missing out. So here's an example. Again, we had another client who had paid in 15,000, then 25, and then 30 over the last three tax years. We sat down with him and said, okay, well, what can you do now? So we, in essence, can carry for the last three tax years on these allowances, so roughly 50K that comes to, plus you can use this year's allowance of 60K. So the fact that his relevant earnings and he ticks all the boxes required, he can actually pay in 110,000 pounds this year. So again, it's really powerful because I think if people have had to stop and actually then their profits pick up again, they can actually make sure that they can make up the payments and they aren't losing out. So as you can see, retirement planning comes in lots of different shapes and forms. You know, it is looking at what are your personal and business assets? You know, what are your planning objectives? How do we make sure these all align and actually make sure they all work together? And as I've said, you know, what we're seeing is more and more, it isn't just about pensions when it comes to retirement planning. It's actually looking across the board saying, okay, well, I'm extracting from the business, yes. But also what am I doing in regards to, you know, savings? Where am I drawing from? In what order? How am I maximizing it? What am I doing from a estate planning point of view? So it's really a case of trying to look at all these things under one roof and actually make sure that where you are today, you're going to have the retirement that you want, but then also then your legacy is protected as well. Now, next steps, we always say to people, look, if you've got your affairs in order, that's absolutely brilliant. Or I'd ask you to consciously do sense check because rules change. Um, if you haven't, you've got two options. You can do nothing and the chance will love you because sadly you'll pay extra income tax, you know, inheritance tax and so on. It won't be as efficient. Or you can arrange an obligation meeting with me if you have any questions. Any questions? Thanks, Louise. Um, there is one question that's already come up um, from Michael Parnell. Um, oh, hold on a second, it's disappeared. Um, if using carry forward, do those early years have to have met the personal tax relief rules? 
So when you come, it's, it's, it's in, you need to look at individually, it depends on how you're doing the carry forward, if it's by an employer or an individual contribution. So what you basically have to do is you look at how much have you, I mean, it's very crude, but you say, how much did you pay in versus the 40,000 pound you could have? paid in you don't necessarily have to have had the relevant earnings in those years it depends on like I said how you're making the contribution but then what you do is you'll roll it all forward and you so in the example I gave on my screen that 110,000 pounds you'd have to have the relevant earnings in this current tax year to be able to pay that much in excellent um uh Jenny Davis said that's the most detailed and closed explanation of the cash flow model <laughs> she's ever heard. <laughs> Glad to hear it, Jenny. <laughs> a lot of people are saying very interesting and thought provoking. So um, thank you very much, Eloise. In the interest of time, as we only have 10 minutes left, if anybody does have any further questions for Eloise, would like her contact details, then uh, do let me know and I can put you in touch. And as with Jenny's presentation, we'll attach that to the recording of the coffee morning. So you have that detail. Um, so uh, I'm now going to move over to um, Kerry, who has some uh, points from HMRC to share and a bit more of a technical update. So uh, Kerry, I know you want me to share some links as well in the chat. So as I listen to you speak, I will share those links. Perfect. Thank you. I'll be as quick as they were two very in-depth, um, very great presentations. So thank you. <clears throat> So um, Sam's already explained that I'm stepping in for Sarah today to give you a roundup of some of the HMRC updates. Um, Sarah's at Westminster today, a meeting regarding the regulation of the bookkeeping and accountancy industry, which I know she's touched on before. So that's a really key meeting today to move that forward. Um, so I'm sure she'll update you when she can. Um, and also next Tuesday, Sarah and I are at another meeting with HMRC regarding um, the Making Tax Digital ITSA, um, which they're hoping now to mandate for 2026 um, and having a lot of collaborative meetings with the key stakeholders to make that the delivery, um, how they'd like it to come out, really. So um, if you've got anything um, or any views on it, sir, that you want us to take forward, then please send them in. Um, would that be to marketing if we've got any, if anyone wants to share any views on it, sir, just send it to the marketing at iab.org.uk. Um, a few bits of industry news. So HMRC have introduced some cool waiting times on various helplines. So I think we've all shared the frustrations of phoning various HMRC um, helplines in the past. So there's now expected call wait times on the PAYE helpline and from the fourth, um, so from the fourth, so last week, um, child benefit, tax credits, VAT, online services, NI, the CIS and the employers helplines will all now have um, the previous day's average wait times on the beginning of the call. So you can then decide whether you want to try other channels or remain on the call. So they have seen um, already um, call wait times um, reduced from 40 minutes at the start of the trial to consistently below 20 minutes because people have left the queue and found what they need through their digital services instead. So. Um, just to bear in mind, though, the self-assessment helpline is currently closed, as we all know, um, and is due to be open on the 4th of September. Um, HMRC have also asked for us to share to make sure that PAYE payments are being made using the correct employer's reference numbers. Um, there's a lot of calls coming through just to reallocate payments where employers have paid just money to their employers um, uh, reference without adding an extra four digits to determine the, the tax year and the tax month that that money relates to. So just pair that in mind. Um, and also the P11D filings that happened on the, by the 6th of July the payment for the Class 1A national insurance needs to be paid also in July um, with the, the PAYE, but it's important to note that that relates to last tax year, so to use the 2313 as the reference at the end to make sure that money gets allocated to last year's um, reference as such. Okay. Uh, also um, with P11Ds, um, women who count have been payrolling benefits um, for the first time this year. And um, with the 
with payroll and benefits, it means that then the benefits are being dealt with in real time through payroll. Um, so if anyone is interested in doing that, they need to register for the next tax year now before April 24. And I'm sure we'll touch on that further um, on coffee mornings throughout. But it just means then that the tax and NI is paid in real time rather than having this catch up lump sum payment that's needed in the next year. A um, couple of things regarding self-assessment, there's a threshold change. So for the tax year, so the current tax year that we're in, 23 to 24, the self-assessment threshold for customers that are taxed through PAYE has changed from 100 grand to 150 grand. So previously, anyone that earned over 100 grand as PAYE had to do a tax return. Now, if they only have income that's up to the 150K as PAYE income, there's no need for a tax return and HMRC will send an exit letter if their 22 to 23 tax return shows income between 100 and 150k. A um, few little extras though that if they do have receipt of any other tax untaxed income, they're a partner in a business partnership or they have the, uh, they've got a liability for the high income child benefit charge or have separate self-employed individual gross income of a thousand pounds then they still need to do the tax return. Um, and then there's some links that Sam is going to share, I think one's already gone in, um, regarding national minimum wage. About a week ago, press release was made by HMRC naming and shaming over 200 companies failing to pay the national minimum wage. So this is really quite topical, it's in the news right now, so have a look at the link. Um, Although they know that not all minimum wage underpayments are intentional, there is no excuse for underpaying workers. And there's a new check your pay campaign, which is available online. So employees can check, employers can check, and it's all linked with ACAS. Um, so that, um, that link is a checkyourpay.campaign. Um, it can be shared on social media as well. Um, and... It's just, I think, really highlighting because there's been so many changes to national minimum wages um, and depending on what age you are and whether you're an apprentice and getting that right first time. And then lastly, you may have seen the IAB share across our social media sites regarding tax avoidance schemes. Um, they've started to name like companies that have been using tax avoidance schemes um, and it's really any avoidance scheme it's anything that bends the tax rules to try and gain a tax advantage that parliament never intended um, so I'm hoping that we'll be able to get a speaker to come on from HMRC from a meeting that I've been on um, to share that in more depth with you but if you see those um, those social media messages going out through the IAB and I know Women in Account have shared it, then please look at that and share on amongst your own um, owners because I think people are trying to, you know, it's hard with the cost of living, people are thinking if they can save tax and there's a, a company that recommend, that says that they can do that for you, people might look into that and this is really just highlighting that it's never as good as it seems. Um, so anyway, that's all from me today. A bit of a whistle stop tour. Lovely to see you all. Um, any questions, obviously give us a shout, but hope that was helpful. Thank you, Kerry. Um, so that was uh, perfectly timed, actually. We're just uh, three minutes to go until the uh, to the end of the session. Um, there is still one question outstanding, which I've just uh, messaged the person concerned. It's for you, Eloise. So I'll reach out to you and, and tell you that question if that person doesn't. Um, and as I said, there'll be a link on the newsletter to Coffee Morning, catch up and the presentations from today will be linked to the recording. So thanks to our speakers. I think all of the feedback has been quite consistent in that it's been, you know, very informative, really detailed um, presentation. So thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for having us. Thank you. You're nice I'm sure we'll be speaking, Jenny. <laughs> I'm sure we will. <laughs> Bye. Thank See you. you. Bye. See you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.